Hey, Secrets Readers, we are coming to you again from Audio Advice Live 2023 in the wilds of Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> and here we are, in case you had to figure it, with Sonus Faber and the wonderful Will Klein, who is going to walk us through this insanely gorgeous looking, astonishingly wild loudspeaker <laughs> from the mad minds at Sonus Faber, and it is the Sonus Faber Stradivari. And Will, sir, <laughs> what, what is there to say about this incredible looking thing? Mm, more than we can pack into this interview. Sure, <laughs> now, the Stradivari is an icon of Sonus Faber. The original Stradivari launched in uh, 2002, 2003, and made it over to the United States. It was our first flagship speaker, and it was a speaker that really set Sonus Faber on the map as not just a fine artist and crafts uh, producer of beautiful loudspeakers, two-way speakers, and obviously the Amati being our first floor stander back in 1998. The Stradivari represented a project that was really cost no object. It was the first time that we could throw anything at the wall to see what stuck. And there was subsequently a lot of technology that came out of the development of the Stradivari that then trickled down into the rest of the line. Gotcha. So it's always been one of the most iconic, one of the most important, certainly one of the most recognized and well-known speakers out there. And it was really the first speaker to hit the market that had this unique wide baffle design. So it had it had this similar wide baffle design in its, in its original state, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, a little less of the kind of edges and curves that we see on here, a little bit different. This is more of kind of a trapezoidal shape, okay. whereas the original Stradivari was more of just kind of an oval. But gotcha. the idea was essentially you took the most strong, the strongest parts of the loot shape, which Dennis Faber had been known for, mm -hmm. and you essentially put two of those together, right? So gotcha. where you have all of this strength, all of this great rigidity, right? We essentially almost take two cabinets, put them face to face, and allow for the strongest parts to essentially define the edges. Now, the real advantage to this design is much of the energy that would find its way out into the room to be reflected at different reflection points or absorbed by different materials in the room is actually broadcast more toward the listener and into the listening space. Okay. So as a result of this, we get much more presence and immediacy than even some of our top tier offerings. Right? It's a very unique speaker in terms of its presentation, especially in the mid-range and high frequency. There's a oh. sense of impact in okay. the mid-range. You know, there's this great Marsan track that I play, uh, Kashmir, right? mm -hmm. where there's a point where he just kind of starts rattling on the guitar with his knuckles, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of percussive. Uh, presentation and there's a, an immediacy and a presence and an impact to it where you can almost feel the waveforms hit your face, you know, kind of hit the hairs on your face as it's there. It feels so present and in the room and it has this defining impact to it. It's really, really unique, honestly, amongst any speaker I've ever heard before. Um, it almost likens the things that I really love about a great panel speaker, right? Where you've okay. got all of this surface area that's interacting with the environment gotcha. just in the mid-range and high frequency. So even though technically it's not louder, there's not more volume, mm -hmm. there's more presence, there's more information, there's more energy. And that's exactly what this does. It just broadcasts more energy into the room. So as far as delicacy, if we're talking about the subtle details of you know a guitarist moving their fingers up and down the fretboard or a saxophonist lifting his lips from the reed, those tiny little subtle details, mm -hmm. uh, they're maintained in a way where the presence is never lost to the suck outs in the room, to the different absorptive surfaces or reflective surfaces that may be lost in the room itself. So you window wow. out much of the room. So this speaker, even though you know, its form factor would indicate, just looking at it, that it's going to be a little bit more finicky to set up. And there are certainly things about it that mm -hmm. do make it a bit more difficult. We need to be very, very careful about toe angle, for instance, okay. much more than some of our other offerings. Oh, okay. But in terms of overall placement, it does wind up being incredibly versatile because I can literally set this directly up against a sidewall and not really have to worry about too much negative waveform cancellation really? from the reflection of that sidewall. Okay. Right? So this is one of the few speakers in the Sonus Faber lineup that can literally be placed in a corner and actually make a really nice sounding sound stage. Yeah. Very unique in that respect. I'll say one thing I did not expect to come away after we did the debut in Munich. Uh -huh. uh, my feeling about this speaker, I knew that the Stradivari was gonna be special. I knew that our current team is better than we've ever had before. We've got amazing engineers, amazing tools, uh, both on the software and hardware side that uh -huh. we've never had before. We've got more capabilities than ever. So I was expecting to be impressed. Uh -huh. 
I was not expecting to be haunted the way that I am. Right? I cannot stop thinking about this speaker and where I was absolutely 100% resolved in upgrading my beautiful Olympica Nova 5s into the new Amati Gen 5. And then all of a sudden this ah, thing comes I heard along these. and <laughs> now I'm screwed, right? Now I have to serious. figure out different furniture arrangements, how to get these things into my I room, mean, just, but I can't live without them. I mean, I, I was, like I was saying, you looked like you could just dive into the finish. <laughs> it's so, like, deep. I mean, if you're going to be haunted by something, I mean, this would be the thing. <laughs> I mean, Jim, Merry Christmas. It's Look incredible. At it. And the details. I mean, we went ahead and we put this beautiful finished veneer on the terminal plate. Like, who does that? Mm. Right. There's this beautiful window, kind of a uh, uh, call out to the Maxima Amateur, which is a great and uh, very popular product in our Heritage series. But we've got this window that essentially allows you to see the crossover in the back of the unit. It's one wow. of the most beautifully finished crossovers we've made. All hand wound in Italy, everything's placed right there. And one of the things that's unique about the new Homage series across the board, from the Guarneri all the way up to the new Stradivari here, mm -hmm. is we've actually gone to some of our top partners in component manufacturing. Mm -hmm. right? So we look at uh, Mundor from their great gold oil resistors. We look at Clarity Cap and their fantastic capacitors and all these great manufacturers, what we call the jelly bean parts, right? The little right. pieces that go into the actual board and the crossover. And we approach those manufacturers with improvements on their flagship designs that mm -hmm. we've actually modeled in our in our software oh, okay. um, according to our specifications and particularly for the use in our crossover designs and every one of them was actually happy to work with us and partner up with us and we've been working for these guys for oh, yeah. these guys for decades yeah. um, so they were happy to make essentially new flagship components specifically for our crossover. So if you look inside the Sonus Faber Oma series crossovers, you're going to see Sonus Faber by Clarity Cap. You're going to see Sonus Faber by Mundorf. You're actually going to see labels of Sonus Faber mm -hmm. for all of these unique models that these fantastic component manufacturers make. Right? Nice. Kind of a nerdy thing, but something I'm really, really oh, proud it's, of because there's really no other manufacturer that can brag that fact. Right? Yeah. At this level, it's 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 very cool. It's, and it's we've nice. been obsessed with our crossover design. It's one of the things that often gets lost in the beautiful wood finishes of our products is we're obsessed with crossovers. I mean, we have two different patented technologies, different topologies that we've invented that we feel are the very best crossovers in the world. And we're actually implemented both of those designs. Okay. Uh, the interactive fusion filter is what we're using in between the mid-range and the, and the tweeter. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, for the rest of the system, we use the balanced circuit called the Paracross topology. Oh, okay. Crossover, right, right. which is something that's, uh, you know, finds itself in, in many of our other models. The great thing is by using that combination, the IFF gives us a little bit more of that presence and almost that uh, tube-like presentation in terms of the way that it floats images in the middle of the air. You know, mm. lots of space, lots of clarity, lots of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we move down to the Paracross section, it has amazing power handling and very, very quiet because it's a balanced design. So it rejects any radio frequency or electromagnetic interference that may interfere with the, uh, the clarity of the music. So together, working in tandem, they essentially create what I consider to be the best analog crossover network ever made. So we can maintain the detail, the clarity, the presence, all of the warmth and the liquidiness that we're looking for from that IFF, and at the same time, we can handle gigantic presentations with lots of power. And being partnered up with Macintosh, it's good to be able to handle lots of power. <laughs> power is good. That so uh, good. it's it's amongst the most versatile of the crossovers that are out there, and yet still maintains the attributes of what you look for in a great crossover, which is detail, clarity, information preservation, right? Mm -hmm. Not losing any of that in the little components in that crossover. Right. We also make some of the simplest crossovers that are in there. We always feel that, and there's an old adage, you know, the, the, the simpler circuits yield the best results, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is just make the crossover such that it does exactly what it needs to do with the fewest parts possible, and you're interfering with the signal path as little as possible. Not and sure. toward that end, one of the other um, patented technologies that we've developed for the entire Homage series, and certainly found its way here into the Stradivari, is our new Intono technology. And this is another kind of nerdy thing. <laughs> but essentially, with the Intono technology, we're utilizing our internal chamber, which is something that we do for all, even from the Olympica series all the way up. Mm -hmm. We have a dedicated internal chamber chamber for our mid-range drivers, which is optimized to the frequency range that the mid-range handles, right? Okay. So it's essentially an acoustic loading configured specifically for that frequency range. We also have a sealed enclosure for our tweeter, 
Mm -hmm. right? But our tweeter in every single one of our models from the Sineto and up has something called a rear labyrinth attached to the back of it. Right? Mm. The rear, rear labyrinth is actually a puck of wood mm -hmm. and it has a laser etching into the back of it, the part that adheres to the back of the tweeter, such that there are no parallel surfaces and there's oh, no okay. consistent depth, right? So it's a completely irrational shape, which okay. means you're not gonna get reflection. Everything's gonna completely uh, cancel itself out. Mm -hmm. So because we have that rear labyrinth on the back of the tweeter and we have an additional chamber that that sits in, mm -hmm. what we've done, and this is one of those things that's so simple, I can't believe we were the first ones to think of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it essentially uses what is often seen as a negative attribute to a ported system okay. and we spin it into a positive. Right, so let me explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The internal chamber for the mid-range is sealed, and anytime you have a sealed enclosure, whether we're talking about a multi-way system or a single driver, there's going to be a particular frequency or frequency range at which you build up pressure inside mm -hmm. of that chamber. The air pressure just builds up to the point where it actually impedes the physical motion of the driver. Right. All right? Now this is going to directly translate to electrical impedance in your amplifier. Mm -hmm. right? It just makes the driver harder to push from an amplification standpoint. Okay. Now what most manufacturers will do to compensate for the what's called the uh, detriment of a sealed enclosure, is they will actually go into the system, usually in the crossover, and they will increase the impedance of all the other drivers and all the other frequency ranges such that it matches that peak that they're getting from the sealed enclosure. Okay. Uh, and so this obviously requires many, many more parts in the crossover. It requires less of the overall clarity that we're going to get, or, or, or results in less of the overall clarity that we mm -hmm. get from a, a well-built crossover. So. What we did is we actually utilized the fact that we're using two sealed chambers here, mm -hmm. and we created a porting system in between the two. Mm -hmm. Now, most folks don't actually know how a port works, right? Most people mm -hmm. assume that a port is basically a hole in the speaker that allows the driver to move more freely. And that's not, not true, but it's not really the function of a port. A port right. essentially creates a pocket of air that becomes a passive radiator. Mm -hmm. right, so it's essentially the same pocket of air vibrating back and forth that's interfacing with the air external to the cabinet and thereby mm -hmm. creating more low frequency energy with the same amount of amplification from your amplifier. Right? Right. So it makes the speaker more efficient in the lower registers, which mm -hmm. is why almost all of our designs are ported. Mm -hmm. The detriment to a ported design is there will be a tuning frequency or what we call a failure frequency, a mm -hmm. frequency at which any wing, anything below that is either going to cancel out, so we're not really getting as much output, or you're actually going to have the driver start to knock, right? Or actually mm -hmm. start knocking into its voice coil. Right. And up and above and below that frequency, you can get situations where the driver's moving like crazy and the port's not shooting any air whatsoever and mm -hmm. you're getting no bass, or the driver's completely still and the port's moving air in and out like crazy and you're still getting no <laughs> bass, right? Different levels of this cancellation right. that happens right. at that frequency. Well, that's seen as a detriment, obviously, because once you reach that frequency, you're not getting any more sound output or you're getting a very irregular frequency response. Mm -hmm. But we turned it into a positive. So essentially we tuned the port, all right? We have a very special port that's built into this that actually joins the two enclosures specific to the, uh, respectively, uh, tweeter and mid-range. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we tune that port to the exact frequency where we have that spike in physical impedance on the mid-range driver. Oh, okay, okay. All right? So when that port fails, so to speak, in this mm -hmm. case succeeds, right? Mm -hmm. when that port fails, it essentially opens up and instead of being a vibrating pocket of air, it allows for that pressure to naturally dissipate into the other chamber. So it's, a, it, but it's, but it's an open port. It's not like, there's not like any sort of valve or anything. Two sealed chamber, yeah, it's just a port. Right? Okay. Two sealed chambers mm -hmm. and then a port in between. So gotcha. again, ridiculously simple. I can't believe nobody thought about it before us, but we patented it. We're calling it Intono and nobody's allowed to do it but us. <laughs> <laughs> but they the want real... to have to pay you for it. So <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. there's licensing, right? Yeah. The real advantage to this is it allows us to build much, much, much more simple crossover networks because we don't have to worry about that impedance spike Mm -hmm. right? Everything is much, much more, I mean, over 50% reduced in terms of that overall spike. So we have a much more consistent overall impedance and we can work with that to make sure we have as few components in our crossover and still do the job properly. Nice. So sonically, we're getting more clarity 
we're getting more impact, we're getting more information from the mid-range and high frequency, and it tends to meld into the rest of the system better, just because of the simplicity, both in the physical domain and in the electronic domain. Gotcha, gotcha. Hey, can, can you, uh, which all sounds amazing, <laughs> it's very <laughs> cool stuff. Um, could you go into maybe a little detail about the individual drivers and Absolutely. stuff? Absolutely. Uh... So we're using a classic design, what's become really one of our uh, most important technologies, most well-known technologies, I should say the damped apex dome tweeter. And this, of course, essentially applies local damping to the tip of the tweeter, which simply by nature of the energy of the tweeter being created from the circumference of the diaphragm, unlike with any other driver where essentially you've got the motor at the center of the diaphragm. With the tweeter, the center, or I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the uh, diaphragm uh, is being activated by the motor, which is on the outside, mm -hmm. right? It's on the edges of it. So as those waveforms, as those vibrations find their way through that and permeate that uh, diaphragm, what's going to happen is you're going to have negative waveform interactions where those waveforms meet each other, mm -hmm. which happens to be right in the center, right at the apex of the dome. So simply by dampening that, by literally applying pressure to that in the physical domain, it completely eliminates any of that noise, any of that anti-phase information, any of that negative negative waveform interaction that we would get from the very tip of the dome. Gotcha. And this is not unique to Sonos Fiber. This is something that every speaker manufacturer that works with a silk soft dome has to figure out how to deal with. Right. And in the past models, before we developed the DAD, we essentially do what's doping, um, which a lot of manufacturers do, where you essentially paint the silk with something that makes it more rigid. So you get uh -huh. less of that antiphase behavior, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. This is the best solution I know of. And again, hmm. Simple solution, yep, we were the first ones to do it. We were able to patent it. That's what's ours. Yeah. We call it DAD and nobody else can do it. <laughs> Moving on to the mid-range driver, we actually developed a brand new, and this is one of the most unique things about the new Homage series, this brand new phase plug. All right, so essentially, a phase plug is a static piece in the middle of the driver that allows the driver to move around it. And it's almost similar to the way that we address our tweeter because you're going to get anti-phase information from the center of that cone. Mm -hmm. right? So we get more accuracy when we add the phase plug, which is the static place. But we were basically looking at what would be the optimal shape, the optimal curvature of a phase plug. Right? Mm -hmm. Very, very simple. So of course we enter this into our simulation software, and the simulation software comes back with a shape that's similar to this. And we thought there was a mistake, there was something wrong. <laughs> what, what is this? What's going on here? Somebody entered some wrong numbers on something, there's something going on here. But we actually looked at it and made a rendering of what the waveforms were doing. And as you know, most of the measurements that are made on a speaker are made in an anechoic chamber from one meter away, mm -hmm. right? which for scientific purposes is perfectly valid, but for listening purposes gives you absolutely no indication of what the speaker sounds like, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and what's important for us is making sure that they're accurate at real listening distances. Right? Mm -hmm. Most people are going to be at least six feet from a speaker like this. Right. So that's really where your measurement should be taken. So with this, we're essentially manipulating the waveform. So this is not only a phase plug, it's also a wave guide. It's interacting with the propagation of the driver such that the energy that's being propagated from that mid-range driver folds in on itself, mm -hmm. propagates out into the listening environment at real listening distances, and then unfolds. And as such, it actually gives us one of the most accurate mid-range drivers ever created at real listening distances. So sonically, the clarity of that mid-range, the individual sonics of the textures of those different mid-range instruments and mid-range presentations, and for me, the impact of that mid-range, the immediacy, the feeling it on your face, right. honestly, might be better than anything we've ever done. Uh, that's... That's some serious. Uh, that's some some serious claims there. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, people. You know, people that complain that Sonus Faber it's not forward enough, or it's not three dimensional enough. It doesn't wrap around you enough. Should really take a listen to the Stradivari here. I think they're going to be surprised at what they hear. Oh man. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, well, yeah, listening to some of the demos you guys are running today, it's. It's something else. It Appreciate really that. is something Appreciate else. Appreciate that. So oh. besides that, we've got a couple of other. Actually, we patented the porting system in this. We can't go too deep into that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a down-firing system, but essentially we manipulated the uh, air movement of the port in such a way that's so unique that we actually applied for a patent for it. Okay. Sonically, it gives us a more consistent output in the low frequencies. Mm -hmm. all right? So it makes the speaker easier to place. There's more environments where we can get it to work. The one thing that I think I'm most proud of mm -hmm. on this particular design is the new woofer. Mm. So this is, to my knowledge, the first time, Sonos Fiber being the first company that actually implemented 
a dual voice coil woofer into a high-end loudspeaker. All right? yeah. This is a technology that you usually see in competition car audio where you just need ridiculous SPLs and you don't care about accuracy. Mm -hmm. Or live sound, again, where you just need lots and lots of low frequency energy and not necessarily the most refined. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we actually reconfigured, almost reimagined the neodymium slug from which the motor is driven. Mm -hmm. right? And the idea is, if you've got a coil, or if you've got a voice coil that has two different coils on it, you need to be able to make sure that the magnetic flux, the energy that they undergo as they go through their travel, is exactly precisely the same mm -hmm. for both of those coils. Right? Seems simple, it's never actually been done before. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to reinvent literally the shape of the neodymium slug at the back of the basket in order to enact this, to be able to make a perfectly symmetrical force factor for both of those different coils. Wow. And as such, not only are we getting the additional excursion, which means more bass, lower bass, the ability, the ability to fill larger spaces, we're also getting more delicacy, more accuracy, more control of that driver. So you mm -hmm. can hear the subtle vibrato of the undertones of a stand-up bass as they ring out into the recording space. Right. Much more clarity, much more information in that low frequency. That's, that's, that's the thing that I've really just fallen in love with, with this speaker. Oh, wow. I can't get enough of it. Now these are, are these 10-inch uh, drivers? Or? They are, yep. So dual we're doing a dual driver. voice coil, dual 10-inch driver. Wow. Never been done before. Wow. Yeah, that is <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> That's something else. So you're looking at $50,000. We've got three finishes available. This is the Wenge finish that we're looking now. I really, really fell in love with the red finish that we debuted in Munich. It's absolutely beautiful. And we are bringing back one of my favorite finishes ever, the graphite. Oh, the graphite. Yeah, there's a few, I know a few people who've asked about that. Yeah, yeah we're bringing it back. So we've nice. got a very neutral, you know, home theater enthusiast, people that want something dark that's not going to really stick out when the lights are off, you're covered. But then when you get some light on there, especially natural light, you can yeah. see the depth of the finish. You can it's, see the silvery undertones. It's really special. Really, really beautiful. It's yeah. my favorite finish. Nice. Now, I did just, just so I want to be clear, uh, when you said the, the speaker itself is ported, mm -hmm. the, uh, so it comes out the bottom? Yeah, so it's a down port. And essentially what we've got is about here and here on the bottom of the speaker okay. are where the ports are. Okay, so basically two ports so out the bottom. Clear. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this is just, uh, it's just a gorgeous looking thing. Unbelievable, mm -hmm. and yeah, and, and like I was saying, sitting through the demos that, that you had going on today, it was like, yeah, something very special. We've been having so much fun. I've never seen more head bobbing and foot tapping than I've seen at this show. This is absolutely incredible. It's exactly the response that we look for when we show. That's so awesome. yeah, awesome. great response so far. I'm blown away by them, and I've got pretty high standards. <laughs> yes, you do, sir. <laughs> Although yes, I am sir. biased, I've got pretty high standards. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I just think we nailed it. I think we knocked it out of the park with this one, and I can't imagine what the reception's gonna be like when they actually start to flood into the American market. Oh man, I'll, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll bet it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sure that, I'm sure the demand's been insane with the, with these that yeah, premiering. Already so. blowing away our expectations just in terms of the interest. Wow. Absolutely. Well, this, this has been, this is, I mean, it's a phenomenal speaker and, and Will, thank you man so much for your time. It's my to, pleasure, thank you. To, uh, to walk us through it, because this is, Jiminy Christmas, look at this thing. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. You bet. Have a good one.